Dr. Garagus, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. We are so happy to have you on and we are looking forward to this talk for the day. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. And we typically start off our episodes just kind of asking just a couple of general questions, getting to know you a little bit, and then we'll jump into the topic of the day. Um, so our first question we have is, you know, there's a there's a lot of residents that may be listening to this as well and kind of trying to choose what they want to go into. What made you uh, want to go into academics? So I'm, I'm, I went into academics initially. So I, I went to, um, uh, I, I worked at Duke. I was there as a, uh, for my residency training. I, I went to Harvard med school and then Duke for residency. And then after residency, I did my fellowship at Roth and I went back to Duke as an attending and I, I was familiar with that academic setting. I liked a lot of, um, a lot of things about research and teaching that are easily facilitated in academics. Uh, since then, I now work at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush um, in Chicago, and which is kind of a, a hybrid model. It's a so-called private IMIC. So we have fellows and residents. We do a lot of research. Um, so in that sense, it's very academic, but it's private practice in ter terms of how the practice is run and the kind of control I have over my kind of employees and my schedule and that sort of thing. So I, I like academics was great. And I still like that the, the teaching and research part of the academics, but I also like being in this hybrid model a lot. It was almost like the, I mean, that sounds like the, the best of both worlds in a way, you know, you, you get to kind of run your practice somewhat how you would like to, uh, but still get the the opportunity to teach um, residents and things like that. So that's pretty awesome. That sounds yeah. like a, a pretty sweet deal. It's it, it's a great it's a great situation. I'll tell you the um you know there there are some other programs that are like that in the country. They're and it's unique. It works really well. I'll tell you the uh, you know the downside is you're running your own business, right? So um, for example, during COVID. You know, I was responsible for the bottom line and, uh, you know, we were shut down. We had no money coming in. I have employees that I have to care about and think about. And, you know, if you were in a big academic center, you wouldn't have to sweat that stuff so much. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you're, you're really kind of in a, you have to have that entrepreneurial spirit and, and, you know, figure out a way to kind of run things efficiently and, and weather the storms when they come. So, you know, it, it works well for me, but it's certainly not for everybody. Yeah, that's definitely something to think about. I, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know, you don't really think about all these different moving parts, I guess, you know, going through residency, uh, I guess, until you get there, and then, then, then you, you know, then you have to uh, consider all those different uh, aspects. Yeah, you kind of uh, eat what you kill in private practice, man, you eat what you kill. But uh, next question, and this is just something sort of outside of orthopedics, what, what are some of your interests or hobbies outside of medicine? Oh, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a dad. I've got two wonderful little boys. So they're, they're a big part of my life, watching them grow and do sports and um, things like that. And then uh, my, my whole family, my wife and my kids, we all like hiking and kind of being outdoors. So I would say those are the main ones. I also like, like a bunch of water sports. I grew up by the ocean, so I like doing kind of, uh, you know, ocean related type things, hmm. surfing, et cetera. But, uh, but here in Chicago, it's mostly the hiking, <laughs> not a lot of surfing. Here. Yeah, I'm about to say, <laughs> not a lot of surfing out there. I, I taught, uh, I taught young Cody how to surf. Oh, uh, uh, here we go. <laughs> I, took him, I took him to LA for his birthday one year. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, really, I really did. We, we went, we went surfing once and uh, yeah, that was and, pretty fun. LA it was pretty, yeah, it was pretty fun. Good. <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm no, I'm no good, but it was fun. <laughs> um, but uh, last, last question, and, and this is just because I know we have a lot of residents who listen to our podcast. We're residents ourselves, and sometimes you can go through residency, and it seems so tough, but uh, I always just like to hear other people's uh, views when they're on the other side of things. And so this question is, what was your most meaningful moment during re residency? Kind of looking back now, if, if anything at all. Um, yeah, well... It's a good question. I've actually, I've done a lot of these types of interviews. I've never been asked that. And I would say, um, I'm going to tell you guys something that I haven't told a lot of people, honestly. So I, I very much thought about quitting at one point of residency. And I think this is important for all residents to think about. I mean, I, I really was so gung-ho orthopedics. 
and I got into it. I finished my intern year and it, it was, it was kind of like, you know, you, you sort of know intern year is going to be really hard, especially at Duke. You know, it's kind of an old school, like uh, at that time, you know, the real, it was, at that time it's changed now, but it was a general surgery uh, focused internship. And uh, I knew it was going to be hard and I got through it. And then, uh, and then the second year was really hard for me because I thought this is not that much better. I thought it was intern year and then it was going to be all downhill from there. Right. And you become a second year like, this is pretty darn hard too. You know, I'm still right. getting woken up in the middle of the night and I'm still, you know, I'm just getting pages from, uh, from other doctors instead of from nurses, but it's basically the same thing. You know, I'm getting these consults instead of, <laughs> instead of, you know, changing some orders, but basically, so that was very hard. And I thought, do I really want to do orthopedics? You know, should I do something else? And, and I actually got so far as to like talking to other people in their specialties and, you know, I had kind of a, a moment there of, you know, am I on the right path? And, uh, and I ultimately said, yes, I, I think I am. I, I want to do this. I'm committed to this. And I'm already, you know, at that point, year and a half into it. And I'm, I'm really glad I did. I love my job. I love everything I do. I can't imagine doing anything else. So I guess my advice to the residents out there would be just stay the course. Number one. Number two is, you know, that, that PGY two year can be kind of sneaky hard because you don't expect it to be <laughs> as challenging as it is. So I guess if I tell you to expect it, then you'll, then you'll be ready for it. And you'll know that, believe me, when you get into certainly third, fourth, fifth year, and obviously your career beyond fellowship is amazing. Being an attending is just great. I mean, then, then things really come together. So just stick with it. And uh, you guys are picking, and girls are picking the right career. It's just a fantastic uh, profession to be a part of. Uh, and I think that's great because um, I'm sure there's somebody that's probably listening to this somewhere that are, you know, could possibly maybe having the exact same thoughts that you were having at that, at that point and maybe thinking they're alone and they need to know that, you know, they're not to, just like you just said, stick with it. Um, you know, it'll, it'll all pay off one day. You'll be happy and on podcasts like Dr. Garagus here. So um, stick with it guys. And, and Dr. Garagus, thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, so I guess now we can go ahead and, and switch, uh, switch lanes and get into our case and our talk of the day. And we kind of just have a general case that we um, that we just made up, and then we'll kind of go on to things from there. So, let's say that a 60-year-old male comes into the office. He's a laborer. He's been working construction his whole life, and he says that his shoulder's been hurting him for uh, decades, but it's been getting a lot worse. It's bothering him with daily activities, and he just said he has pain, pain, pain. Uh, what are some of the things that we should be thinking about when we're talking to these patients to get a history and a physical exam? So you said you already know he has arthritis. Or you don't have. So don't we have don't know. He just. We just know yeah, he just came with those coming with pain. Yes, sir. Right. So you know. So like any. Um, so just like any. You know, the shoulder is obviously part of the upper extremity. So upper extremity, a lot of that has to do with you got to get to know your patients. You got to know what their job is. Like, so as a laborer, is he still working? You know, is he a laborer where he's doing heavy labor or not? You know, what's, you want to understand that. And you want to understand their hobbies. You know, is this a golfer? Is this a guy who does CrossFit? You know, what does he do outside of work? Because really, the upper extremity is all about function, right? The lower extremity is a lot about, you know, movement and locomotion. But the upper extremity can do very fine tasks, but it can do very strenuous tasks just depending on what the patient is asking it to do. And you need to understand what their expectations and needs are gonna be. The second thing is um, you're gonna to wanna to know kind of is it you know the chief complaint, right? So you said pain, but you also wanna know are they having stiffness or weakness along with it? Those kind of might put you down different avenues as far as you know, is this a rotator cuff issue? Is, is this a, uh, is there stiffness associated with whatever, whatever we're dealing with? So those are other things to think about. I would say the um, location and quality of the pain is very helpful. Um, so if the pain is kind of anterior and posterior or in both, that's a typically indicates more of a glenohumeral uh, process. So that could be obviously in a younger patient, a labral tear in this age, you're going to be thinking arthritis. If it's lateral or kind of along the lateral deltoid or even referring down to the deltoid, insertion that's more consistent with a kind of referred pain site for rotator cuff or subacromial pathology so it could be you know bursitis or cuff tear 
And then obviously AC joint is going to be over the AC joint. So we're, um, and then biceps will be kind of anterior lateral radiating down to the biceps. So we really want them to give a sense of where the pain is. And then we want to think about um, obviously history of prior surgeries, prior dislocations, prior fractures, you know, what kind of trauma or surgical history they had, and then what kind of uh, non-operative treatment have they had thus far. So that's kind of my questions I ask. That'll get you 90% of the way there. And uh, that's, that's usually where we start. Yep. And I'm, I'm glad that you even mentioned about how important it is just to kind of get them to show you exactly where that pain is. I mean, that can help you a whole lot sometimes just, hey, you know, point with this finger and show me where it hurts at. And uh, like you say, that sometimes can kind of get your head down the right path. And I mean, that that works in the, the shoulder, around the hip, you know ankle, you know, around joints and things like that, that, that seems to be very helpful if you can get someone to kind of point, like, show, tell me where it hurts. And well, you know what they say, uh, when all else fails, talk to the patient, right? I mean, you gotta, <laughs> you know, I mean, it only is their last resort though. I mean, just kidding. The point is that patients can really, you know, if you really listen to your patients, they will tell you a lot. So really, um, first of all, that's a great way to make a connection with them and, yeah. and, and have them trust you. And second of all, like, you know, they're living with this. So, you know, really, uh, you don't want to fall down the trap of just becoming or basically a radiologist that does procedures, right? You want to really talk to the patient and really get the most you can out of your history and physical exam skills. Absolutely. And, and that actually leads us to the next, the next portion. And I know that is somewhat physical exam, but what other things are we, are we doing on physical exam when we're uh, evaluating these patients with shoulder pain? So I think with shoulder, you know, the, it's, I mean, like anything else, inspection, uh, especially for previous surgical incisions, atrophy is a big one. So in the upper limb, uh, the shoulder as well, like the, the nerves kind of curve around the limb. So it's not, so nerve injuries, like we see them. We see nerve injuries not infrequently. Um, so people that have had prior surgeries or prior dislocations, you know, that axial nerve may be cut or stretched or damaged. And that's really going to change your management, obviously. So you do not want to miss those. You want to do a careful neurovascular exam. Mm -hmm. But you'll often see atrophy just looking at it. You'll also see cuff atrophy if you look over the scapula. So speaking of that, you want to make sure that you can really see the entire shoulder, including the scapula. And one key thing is make sure you look at the patient from behind as they move their arms over their head. A lot of scapular winging gets referred to my... Uh, clinic and it's seen different doctors, therapists, and no one has actually looked at the patient um, from their back uh, with their shirt off ever. <laughs> and, right. um, you know, there's a whole part of the shoulder back there, believe it or not. So you can see the atrophy of the supra and infraspinatus fossae, which can be indicative of rotator cuff pathology. And you can see a winging, um, which can be indicative of, you know, either, either what's called scapular dyskinesia, which means sort of problems with coordination, of the shoulder blade or also a nerve injury if there's medial or lateral wing. So I don't want to get too far afield in that, but you definitely want to do that. Um, you're going to do, I think palpation is helpful, especially the AC joint um, and the biceps groove. Uh, as far as range of motion, that's key. Just you want to really get a sense of range of motion um, because so many conditions in the shoulder are associated with stiffness. The shoulder has more range of motion than any other joint in the body. So um, you know, range of motion is really a critical part of what the shoulder does. So you want to get a sense of, is it stiff? Where is it stiff? And what plane it's stiff in? And then strength testing. Specifically, you're really going to want to look at your rotator cuff tendons. Um, and then obviously your, your distal nerve vessel exam. You have, um, we talked a little bit about C-spine. You know, just like any other joint, you want to look at joint above, joint below. C-spine pathology, very common. You know, the patient will come in and they'll say, I have this pain in my shoulder. And then when you talk to them, it's not really the shoulder, it's kind of more their trap and like kind of rating up to their ear. It's sort of um, maybe between their scapulae and maybe it's a burning pain. I mean, that you really want to think about C-spine. So a lot of, for the residents out there, don't overthink the C-spine thing. So basically, uh, you know, people will often have C-spine pathology and shoulder pathology. And the question is, you know, is it coming from the neck? Is it coming from the shoulder? How do you decide? Do you get studies? It's very, very simple. I'm going to tell you how it is. So if you, if the shoulder hurts when you move your shoulder, it's coming from your shoulder. <laughs> your shoulder hurts like when you move it. your neck, it's coming from your neck. Now, honestly, don't overthink that. 
just the key is to have the patient move their neck and, and they say, oh, I have pain. Well, okay, is it pain in your shoulder? No, it's pain in my neck. Does it recreate your shoulder pain? No, then that's not, that's not coming from the neck. But if they move their neck and they say, yeah, that's it, it radiates down in here, then that's, you know, be very concerned about that. So just the key is kind of looking at that. Uh, I, I love that. I love those simple jewels, simple yet, you know, effective. Um, I definitely like that, you know, part you're talking about making sure you examine the patient from behind, looking for any atrophy of the, uh, you know, supraspinatus or infraspinatus, um, you know, examining for any scapular dyskinesia as well. And then, you know, you talked about strength testing and testing your rotator cuff tendons and, um, and uh, you know, palpation as well. So I think that was a really good overview on uh, how to phys- do a physical examination on these patients. Um, is there anything in particular that will clue you in towards this is shoulder arthritis, like glenohumeral arthritis versus this is, you know, rotator cuff? Yeah. So, so one thing uh, that would, that I didn't mention is kind of how, if they have crepitus or not. So if you have with arthritis, you're going to have significant crepitus. Um, so you kind of palpate the joint as they move and you'll feel that. Um, arthritis, they'll have, a, they'll typically have range of motion loss. So if you see stiffness, you're thinking either could it be frozen shoulder or, you know, scar tissue from some prior surgery or arthritis, you're thinking something down those lines. And then if that plus crepitus, you've made the diagnosis right there on physical exam. And then if you want to know if it's primary glenohumeral arthritis, um, you're going to want to know about the cuff strength, right? So really those key things, those things are key if you're thinking down the arthritis pathway. So when you say primary, what, what do you mean by primary? And I guess you can also mention, you know, versus secondary and things like that. Yeah. So, um, so it's similar to other joints where you arthritis, the quote unquote arthritis is sort of a final common pathway of a bunch of different things. And we don't totally know what causes osteoarthritis. So first of all, you have inflammatory arthritis. That's its own thing. So that, so in the shoulder that we see rheumatoid, you can see psoriatic arthritis, gouty arthritis, um, lupus, et cetera, et cetera. Those are their own thing. And then there's the, um, what I would like to call the kind of wear and tear slash generative type of arthritis. This is your osteoarthritis. So you've got um, you've got primary glenohumeral osteoarthritis, which is our osteoarthritis of the glenohumeral joint. We think it's kind of a wear and tear change. There may be some genetic predisposition. There may be an overuse predisposition. It may be an injury in your childhood that festers over a lifetime. We don't know honestly what causes it, but it seems to come just over time. Secondary glenohumeral osteoarthritis is secondary to some other definable cause. So there are a few in that category. So one would be uh, you could have a fracture, and then the fracture causes kind of stiffness and um, damage to the joint that leads to arthritis. You can have avascular necrosis, so osteonecrosis, where the humeral head blood supply is affected, the head collapses, and now you don't have a round wheel anymore. You have a collapsed humeral head and that will lead to arthritis that's kind of another one you can put in that secondary arthritis category that can happen with or without a fracture obviously you can have um capsulorophy or sorry you could have post instability arthropathy so if you dislocate your shoulder only one time you have a 10 percent lifetime risk of developing osteoarthritis over your lifetime and every time you dislocate it that risk goes up so that first study is a Hovalius study, long-term outcomes of um, after glenohumeral uh, dislocation. And the second one is work by Jules Walsh, W-A-L-C-H, who mm-hmm. has uh, looked at kind of how recurrent dislocation leads to arthritis. So there's instability arthropathy. A third one, um, a third one is going to be uh, capsulorophy arthropathy. Here's another one. So if you have instability, and then a surgeon does a very over exuberant tightening of your capsule to try to stabilize the arm, that change uh, can lead to so much stiffness and altered kinematics that actually leads to arthritis. That's especially true with surgeries that you won't see anymore uh, done in your residency, but you actually will see these patients come into your clinic. These are things like the putty plat operation or the Magnus and Stack operation. These are different operations that. It's probably not worth going into here, but basically these are non-anatomic studies 
where you will take the subscapularis and do some very, very non-anatomic tightening of the shoulder. It definitely keeps you from dislocating again, but it causes arthritis. And that's why you won't see those done anymore in your residency. So, so again, it's instability, um, arthritis secondary to instability, arthritis secondary to capsulography. Um, you can see arthritis secondary fracture, avian. Other ones are, so you may know that some of the local anesthetics are chondrotoxic. So there was a big class action lawsuit where people were putting those intraarticular, so people were putting those pain pumps that you might see done like the regional catheters that where they drip local anesthetic. So people were using those off label uh, in the glenohumeral joint. And it seemed great. You just put it in through the portal and you drip some nummy medicine in there. You don't have to have an anesthesiologist do a brachial plexus block. And those got severe chondrolysis. Um, and basically the entire uh, cartilage would just die because those were chondrotoxic. So you will see those patients every now and then, although uh, those are less and less, thankfully. But the, you know, there are a number of different things that you can see uh, that can lead to the final common pathway of osteoarthritis. It was really good that you went through all those because, um, you know, on these question stems sometimes it's, it's good to recognize that, you know, arthritis comes in different flavors and that's, you know, from the shoulder to the knee. I mean, there's different reasons why you can have arthritis. And so it's good to know. I'm glad that you broke down the way you did primary versus secondary arthritis. And uh, they're, they're good to know. And a lot of times between the history and the physical, you can kind of have an idea if it is a secondary cause for their arthritis, sometimes is, is already a hint in that, in that little piece of information already. Well, it's a great point. And especially, especially true in the OITE. <laughs> so, right. you know, they'll tell you like, like, this is a patient who's had a fracture or had a Magnuson stack or putty plant operation, you know, had some kind of a, some kind of operation that was not anatomic or had um, uh, AVN or had one of these pain pumps. So, you know, they'll put it right in there and what they're leading you down that secondary uh, putting him raw osteoarthritis pathway. Absolutely. And so after we, we've gotten this uh, history and physical from our patient, what, what type of imaging are you normally getting for these uh, patients? So, I mean, it starts with, with x-rays, so plain film x-rays. Um, my favorite x-ray views are going to be the Grashi AP view in neutral rotation. So for those of you uh, junior residents who aren't familiar with the Grashi AP view, it's our preferred view amongst really anybody who's doing a lot of shoulders. So the, a, the true AP view is an AP of the patient's, with respect to the patient's body. But the scapula sits at you know, 30 to 45 degrees with respect to the thoracic cage. So it's not going to be an AP. It's kind of an obliquogram of the glenohumeral joint. The Grashi AP view is gonna come in kind of angled across the patient's chest about, again, about 30 to 45 degrees. So that's gonna be parallel with the glenoid face. And so that's really key to kind of see that glenoid in profile, see the scapula in profile. That's really a, a critical way to look at it. The, um, if you do it in neutral rotation, so that's the other thing is we'll say, you know, you, the classic thing is you get the referral doctor sends you you know, two x-rays, and they're both APs of the patient's body in internal and external rotation. <laughs> it doesn't give you a lot of information. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't tell you a lot. You can't see the glenoid very well. You can't see the humerus very well. They're not orthogonal projections. It's just not what you want. So, so if you put the arm in neutral rotation, so bear with me on this. If the forearm is in neutral rotation, mm -hmm. and so imagine the patient's elbow has been at 90 degrees, and their arm is basically pointed straight out in front of them. Okay, and you've angled 30 degrees across their body, you're gonna get that grashy view with respect to the glenoid and the humeral head is also gonna be in profile because remember there's about 30, roughly, it's variable, but about 30 degrees of retroversion of the humeral head. So right. you're gonna see the humeral head in profile perfectly, you see the glenoid in profile perfectly, you get that grashy AP view in neutral rotation. So that's number one. Number two is gonna be your axillary lateral that's gonna show you kind of anterior posterior translation and really help you see the joint space really well. And then we, we often, get, we usually get the uh, scapular, actually I always get the scapular Y. I, I think it adds the least value of those three. Um, the first two is you're gonna get 90% of your information, but every, every now and then you'll see something on that uh, scapular Y that's helpful to you. 
Now, do you ever use that burn gel view? I know, you know where I am. I'm at Tulane. Um, our attendings, Dr. Savile and O'Brien, use that a lot to evaluate the the glenoid um, a little bit closer. But is that something you use as well, or do you just like I know you just said, ninety percent of what you get is from the AP and the Grashi. But is there ever a time to use that view? So ninety percent of what I get is from the Grashi and the axillary. I'm, I may have misspoke. I'm sorry. No, axillary. I do not get the version of you. Um, I get that for instability sometimes. So um, I get it after I've done a ladder J procedure. It shows that really well. Um, and so again, for instability surgery, or if you're concerned about a glenoid fracture, uh, I will order that, but that's not part of my standard x-rays and, and definitely not for arthritis, but you know, it, Tulane, everybody speaks French. They probably like the French name and uh, <laughs> you know, that's probably part of that, but no, it's, it's a perfectly good view. It, it, and you know, it's, it, the, it is, a, it is another way to kind of look at the glenoid, but in slightly different profile, you'll kind of see, just a little bit different aspect of the glenoid. Um, but I like the, I like the axillary view. And are there, you know, in regards to arthritis, are there any classification? Um, actually, I'm sorry. In what cases will you get a CT scan? You know, I know we talk about um, radiographs, x-rays, but are there any times where you going to get a CT scan? And if so, uh, kind of what are you looking for on a CT? So I get a C. So this comes up a lot because you think, well, wait a minute. If you have, you know, arthritis, and you have a rotator cuff tear, and we'll get to that in a bit. Like, should you get an MRI? Should you get a CT? So um, we can save that for later in the podcast. But ba- if you want, but basically, the CT is the workhorse for primary glenohumeral osteoarthritis, and the reason is you really want to see the glenoid morphology. You want to see the shape of the glenoid, and you want to see the glenoid bone stock. So you're looking at retroversion, you're looking at erosion of the glenoid. The reason is the glenoid component, if you're ever gonna do shoulder arthroplasty, is really critical. And so, um, so you really wanna make sure you get that lined up right and in the proper version. Now, I'm only getting that study if I'm going to surgery for shoulder arthroplasty. If, I'm, if I just needed, I don't need it for diagnosis. I can make that diagnosis off the x-rays. Um, so for me, the CT scan is for basically preoperative planning uh, if I'm going to, to surgery. Um, and also kind of um, helps you kind of classify the amount of glenoid bone erosion. But I don't get that as a standard. Uh, you can make the diagnosis of the x-rays and treat based on that without getting a CT scan. Okay. Um, that's good to know. And so are there any, you know, classification systems that we should know of when we're talking about shoulder arthritis that may commonly be used? Yes. Yeah. One more thing before I get to that. I, I neglected to say the, um, the CT scan will also actually show you the rotator cuff and people say rotator cuff. How, what CT? That's crazy. Well, believe it or not, it does. So um, just a standard CT, you don't even need an arthrogram. will show you the, the quality of the rotator cuff muscle belly. So everyone's familiar with, or maybe familiar with the Goutelier grading scale um, of rotator cuff yes, uh, fatty yes. infiltration. So you may not be familiar with the fact that that was Goutelier's original paper described that gradient scale is described in CT is for use with CT. It was modified later by Fuchs, F-U-C-H-S at all for MRI. But believe it or not, you can do Goutelier grading with, with, uh, with CT. That's in fact originally how it was described. So did not know that. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that you can get a, you know, you just put it in the soft tissue windows and you can look for fatty infiltration hmm. Um, so you can rule out a massive cuff tear, a significant cuff tear, which is the CT. You don't need contrast. You don't need an MRI. So again, another reason why CT is our workhorse. So you were talking about grading scales. So a CT-based grading scale for glenohumeral arthritis is the, is the Walsh classification. Gilles Walsh, W-A-C-L-H, um, is, a, is a great guy, frankly, and a great um, French surgeon. A lot of the surgeons in shoulder arthritis are, are French. So sorry for all the non people who aren't from New Orleans who don't speak uh, French. I don't speak French either, but it's okay. Yeah. You, can, you can get by. But um, anyway, this grading scale is very helpful. And basically the idea is um, there's kind of two big categories to remember this. So the A groups are going to be your patients with centered glenohumeral arthritis. So if you take the axial CT and you take the cut of the CT through the mid glenoid level, that's usually the one that goes through the tip of the coracoid. And then you draw something called your Friedman axis. The Friedman axis goes from the medial aspect of the scapula 
to the center of the glenoid. So just picture that. Imagine the, the, the scapula will look like a, it'll look like a golf ball on a tee, basically, at that um, cut. And you're kind of looking right down the golf tee with that. So that will, um, that Friedman axis should go through the center of rotation of the humeral head. So imagine you've got a, a line, the Friedman axis goes the length of the scapula through the center of the glenoid. It should go right through the center of rotation of the humeral head, right through the middle of that circle. And if it does, it's an A. It's either an A1 or A2, right? If it doesn't, there's some subluxation, then it's something else. It's a, a B or a C, okay? So that's, that's A, B, and C. I like that. That's yeah. You know, that's that's you just centered centered. Uh, if it's centered glenohumeral arthritis, then it's an A. If it's not centered, it's not an A. If the second thing is going to be is there erosion, and if there's erosion, then it's a two. So in an A, the erosion goes straight centrally as the humeral head is centered. It just erodes in. The A two is more common in your patients with inflammatory arthritis, actually. Um, as it progresses, it seems to be a little more centered. If it's posteriorly subluxated, so that's your Bs, then uh, the B2 is going to have posterior erosion. So this is um, this is basically the so-called biconcave arthritis. So as it erodes, you kind of get the facet of the original glenoid, and then you kind of get this neo facet, the neo glenoid, where the where the humerus is kind of eroded away. The, uh, the back of the glenoid. So again, that's B2. And then C is a totally different animal. That's a dysplastic glenoid. So people can be born with a dysplastic shoulder and just like a dysplastic hip, they'll have kind of this hypertrophic posterior labrum. They'll, they won't have the bone there. They'll get arthritis at a younger age, we think, although there's not big studies on that, but certainly we do see this at a younger age presenting. And, and they'll have increased retroversion uh, of the glenoid. So that's your C. There's some, been some modifications to this, but this is the original Walsh classification. This is a great one to use and know because it does um, affect our treatment. So A1 is definitely, uh, that's a chip shot, shoulder arthroplasty. An A2, it depends on how much bone loss you have. A B2 or a B1, same thing. You may have to do a little bit of uh, anterior capsular uh, release to kind of help that subluxation. And then a B2 and C are the ones that are controversial because you have sort of not enough bone left. So you can use like an augmented anatomic glenoid or maybe a reverse uh, or maybe a bone graft depending on the situation. And the C is really tough because people don't know, should you correct them to a quote unquote normal glenoid or should you just leave the glenoid kind of where it is? So that's the most controversial of all, but thankfully it's the most rare. So is, anyway, is... kind of a long-winded explanation, but that's the Walsh classification look it up and, uh, and, and remember it. It's a really helpful one. Yeah. And look like from what you're saying, you know, just on that CT, you have to, you know, pay attention to the relationship between the uh, humoral head and the glenoid. And that, that'll give you the first, at least the first part of the, of the classification, whether it's either centered, it sublux, you know, uh, posteriorly, or if there's like glenoid dysplasia or, you know, retroversion or, some kind of abnormality going on with the glenoid that kind of helps you out with just kind of getting to the A, B, and C. So typically, that's exactly right. So typically, the again, that, that Friedman axis, that kind of line along the scapula will go right through the center of rotation of the humeral head. And the glenoid face, I should say, is typically roughly perpendicular to that line. Mm. So again, think of a golf tee. It's like the top of the tee is perpendicular to the shaft of the tee. And so... Um, you know, it can be five degrees either side, and that's totally uh, within the range of what's uh, considered normal. Um, but if there's erosion or if it's significantly retroverted, you know, that can be a sign of, of you know, erosive changes or, uh, or dysplasia. There it is. I think that was a good summary of it all. And hopefully that, I, I think I have seen this come up on like some questions. So it's uh, high yield enough to, to make sure you learn. OITE is coming up really soon. I know I've seen this at uh, Grand Rounds and being asked it and had no idea what it was. <laughs> this is, yeah. Honestly, there's a lot of classifications in shoulder. If you learn, you know, you got, you probably got to learn like the near classification for fractures, right? You got to learn this one for yeah. arthritis. You know, there's only a couple that you really have, like really should know because they're used. Uh, 
So just uh, I wanted to quickly, uh, I guess, recap what you had said a little bit earlier. So we, we already spoke about what to look for in a history physical exam, um, things to look for in x-rays as well as CT and now classification. Mm -hmm. We touched a little bit on some of the arthritis causes and classifications. I think we talked about you know, primary arthritis, which you just get your glenohumeral humeral um, joint space narrowing. Sometimes you may get some uh, humeral head subluxation. Then you talked about instability arthropathy and capsulorthy uh, arthropathy as well, uh, which can be due to the over tightening of the capsular structures. Mm -hmm. um, you also spoke about chondrolysis, which was um, which was seen after the injections of the of the uh, anesthetic, like the Marcaine, where you get chondrolysis after these arthroscopic surgeries. Uh, what are some of the things to look for on imaging regarding each of these to like kind of clue you in? So, like for sure. example, you see an X-ray of this, and you're like, okay, well that's chondrolysis versus oh, this is probably primary uh, glenohumeral arthritis. Sure. So the condolysis one is kind of a weird one. So let's set that one aside for a second because it's unusual and looks different than the other ones. The other ones all look very similar. So you'll have um, inferiorly. So first of all, you have the loss of joint space, a so joint space narrowing. You'll typically see that best on your axillary lateral, but you'll see it on the Grashi view as well. You'll also have um, inferior humeral osteophyte, the so-called goat's beard osteophyte. And why they call it a goat's beard and not a goatee, you would think of a goat at a beard to be a goatee. I don't know. But, it, but basically, the inferior aspect of the humerus, there'll be this marginal osteophyte. And you think, well, why is it inferiorly? Well, it's just inferiorly that you can see it. It goes around the humeral head like a ring, but it's typically largest inferiorly. And, and that's obviously the part that you can see on this particular view. So you'll see that inferior osteophyte is really, really key. And then... Um, and then those are going to be the kind of key things you're going to look for. The other key thing is going to be you want to look at your acromiohumeral interval. So the interval between the top of the humeral head and the acromion should be at least seven to eight millimeters. If it's less than that, that is indicative of rotator cuff tear. And then you've got a whole different ball of wax. You've got some rotator cuff problem or cuff tear arthropathy or some other issue, but you're going to want to you're going to want to look at that interval is preserved or not. Um, so those are kind of the key things you're going to see. Um, on the axillary lateral, you may see subluxation. Um, we talked about that on the CT, but you, you can get a hint of that on the axillary, and you also might see posterior glenoid erosion on the axillary lateral as well. So also best better observed on the CT, but you're going to see it on the axillary lateral as well. So those are kind of the thing, key things to look for on your x-rays for really all these different kinds of arthritis. If it's post fracture, or if it's post, um, uh, you know, you're, if it's if there's AVN or so AVN, I should say is a little bit different, you're going to see more collapse in the humeral head, you're going to see kind of this area of sclerosis. The sclerosis is the live bone that's trying to respond to the dead bone. And then basically, between that sclerosis and the articular surface is going to be a darker area. That's the dead bone. So for those of you on the call who aren't, you know, vegan or vegetarian, you've had you know, <laughs> meat or chicken or, or a, you know, a steak and the, the animal is dead, obviously, but the bone is still hard. So the bone has, um, you know, rigid mechanical properties, but it can't uh, repair itself. So you get basically get this micro trauma and essentially like little fractures, think of like a stress fracture, but it can never repair itself and then eventually collapses. So you know, relatively early AVN, the joint space will be preserved, but it'll be dead underneath, then it will collapse. And then eventually it'll turn to arthritis. And the arthritis often is indistinguishable from glenohumeral arthritis once it progresses to a certain extent. But it's important to know about um, certainly early on. And then I guess the, uh, the capsulorophy arthropathy, the only thing that's going to be relevant about that is going to be you know, for anatomic total shoulder, if they've done some non-anatomic subscap procedure, that's going to be very important as far as your exposure and do you have rotator cuff issues or things to deal with. As far as the dislocation arthropathy, I guess on imaging, you know, you might have things like glenoid bone loss, right, or hill sacs, and, and so you're going to want to think about um, uh, 
uh, you know, are those, are those going to affect your kind of amount of bone left to put an implant on? Again, that's all going to be well, um, well assessed with a CAT scan, CT scan. Yep. And for these questions, like I, I really think it's key listening to the, you know, listen to the STEM. There is going to be some kind of hint that's going to give you something, whether they had, uh, they've dislocated multiple times in the past and they, you know, they had these multiple surgeries or uh, they have arthritis kind of all over, you know, and they're, you know, they might even show you a picture of their hands or something, you know, it's, they give you something to give you an idea, something else to let you know if they're trying to hint you towards secondary arthritis. So, um, you know, they help you out on the questions and real life is a little bit different. You have to just be, uh, keep these things in mind and uh, you usually, usually do pretty well. Um, so say you have an, oh, oh yeah, and another one, because this can is actually I a, Can I jump in there one? Can I yeah. jump in there with one thing before you go on? Yeah. Really, really quickly, uh, you mentioned the dislocation or arthropathy. A lot of patients will have instability, they'll get arthritis, and then they'll come to you and they'll say, my shoulder is dislocating. And, and you look at the x-ray and you see arthritis. That is very, very, very common. And the key is, they're not really dislocating. They're having what's called saltatory movement. They're basically, you know, you have the arthritis, the, the bone on bone surface will kind of jump. The friction will increase. And then the coefficient of, uh, you know, the force will increase the, or will go past the, you know, coefficient of static friction. And then basically the, the joint will kind of have a kind of quick jump like movement, but it's just because it's a very bad, you know, bearing surface. It's not because, they're actually dislocating. They're, they're never losing glenohumeral, um, you know, registration or, or contact. It's just fear, the joint is just having kind of a jumpy, jerky motion. Don't fall down the pathway of thinking that's really instability. If they're stiff and they have arthritis, they're not dislocating, period. They have the opposite yeah. problem. They have stiffness. Yes, sir. So don't, don't fall into the path of thinking, oh, this person needs like a tightening operation or a, or a, you know, some labor repair, you're going to make them worse. You're going to make them stiffer and more painful. So just kind of a word of the wise, um, because that comes up a lot. And you think, and a lot of these people, patients may have had a history of dislocation. They may even have clonoid bone loss. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, I got to do some big, you know, stabilization operation. No, no, no. If they're stiff, they do not need one of those instability operations. Absolutely good to know. That's a, uh, that's a good, a good pearl for in the clinic. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. That's a good one there. Uh, I know earlier you mentioned about like AVN. I think one of the tie-ins or something that you see on some of the questions sometimes is look out for that with those uh, certain humoral, you know, proximal humerus fractures. Uh, they try to tie that back in with the whole hurdle criteria thing. Um, so know the hurdle criteria when things that kind of hint you towards, you know, having a higher chance of AVN, even though I think that's kind of be kind of been debunked but I have seen some questions about it still um, and that ties right back into arthritis so uh, they love to tie things in in multiple ways to make you think a little bit harder um, so moving on say you know we we have a pretty good idea that our patient has arthritis what are the treatment options that we're going for and you know if we can just go through the whole spectrum from non-op to to operative and why we choose these types of operative uh, techniques and things like that Sure, absolutely. So, so non-operative obviously is your so OIT right coming up end of October right. So you want to um, you know if, if it doesn't say that they've had non-operative treatment, then typically non-operative treatment is going to be your right answer, <laughs> and that's true in the real world too. So the non-operative treatment for this is things like NSAIDs if they're not medically contraindicated, and uh, glutamine corticosteroids. Um, uh, those used to be totally no brainer. Everybody would get one of those. Now people are a little worried about, is there some subtle increased risk of infection if you do it close to surgery? But basically the glenohumeral corticosteroid injection is really the main the mainstay. Um, I don't like to do surgery within um, three months of one of those. Uh, although that's, again, that's, that part's controversial how, how proximate you can do surgery. But the bottom line is that's your mainstay, glenohumeral injections and SEDS. Stretching, I think, is helpful. There are some studies looking at physical therapy for the management of arthritis. So unlike sort of hip, knee, ankle arthritis, where physical therapy has been shown to be a really critical part, physical therapy for the shoulder seems to just kind of inflame things. There's not great studies. These are retrospective reviews that are 
frankly terrible studies. Um, they look at people that come to the, <laughs> they looked at people that came to Dr. Rockwood's shoulder replacement clinic and asked them whether or not they had therapy and if they had therapy, did it help? And they said it didn't help. Well, obviously <laughs> they wouldn't be in a shoulder replacement yeah, shoulder clinic. Replacement right? replacement place. So <laughs> major, major selection bias with that one. But, right. but, right. but, it, in, but in all seriousness, the physical therapy is, I think, not that helpful. Now, I think it is a little helpful to have the patient do a little gentle stretching to keep their shoulder getting from getting stiffer over time. It will tend to get stiffer. If you can push back from that with a little gentle stretching, that's a good thing. So, but I don't send them to PT to crank on things. That's your non op treatment. Uh, visco supplementation, so your um, gel shots, some people talk about that. It's not covered by uh, the majority of insurance plans. Um, and the reason is there's some, study, there's some kind of equivocal data in the literature. I, it's not a part of my treatment algorithm. Some people will do it. I don't, I don't do that. I don't find it terribly helpful. And, and it's, again, it's, it can be cost prohibitive because it's not covered by insurance. So the next one is going to be minimally invasive treatment options. So you can do what's called an osteocapsular release, um, which is basically uh, a procedure like you would do for frozen shoulder. Um, and so we've got one I wrote up called the ARC procedure, which is the arthroscopic circumferential capsulotomy. And basically you take down all the capsule, just like, again, you would do for frozen shoulder. And then you, you can debride some of the osteophytes a little bit. Um, you could take care of, um, the synovium. You're essentially removing the inflamed tissue, you're kind of working around the problem. So you're not going to manage the arthritis itself but you're gonna deal with the stiffness that comes along with it. That can be very, very helpful in the, in the patient who is young and active and has early arthritis, so mild arthritis, where stiffness is their main complaint. If they come in and they say pain is the main issue and they don't have a lot of stiffness, I have found that operation to not be very helpful. It really is helpful for patients who come in and all they want is their motion back. You know, it's, yeah, I have pain, but the motion loss is my main issue. You can give them improved motion with that operation and they'll be happy. You want to be very, very careful with doing that operation in someone who does not have a centered form of glenohumeral hemorrhoiditis. So if you have your B1 glenoid or your, certainly your B2 glenoid, um, B2 though would be not a good candidate for this because it's so advanced, but let's say you have your B1 with some posterior subluxation and you now release that capsule from the posterior capsule, you know, there's concerns that you could actually make the patient worse. And there's some retrospective data that you might make things worse if you do this in people who do not have centered arthritis because, you know, they're going to continue, continue to subluxate more. So caution in those patients. So again, young, active, mild arthritis, stiffness is the main complaint, not pain, and it's centered. That's my indication for that. Otherwise, I don't find it very helpful. The next thing is a huge jump to things like shoulder replacement, right? So there's not another good arthroscopic procedure. There are other arthroscopic procedures. They're not that great. Shoulder replacement, um, basically there's different flavors as you're aware. There's the humeral head hemiarthroplasty. There's the total shoulder arthroplasty and there's the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. So humeral head and hemiarthroplasty is just uh, replacing the humerus. The advantage of that is it's very robust. The, the humeral side typically does not get loose. And so these do not get loose. You can do this in a very young active patient. Uh, and until kind of early in my career, it was still an open question about what's better, this versus the anatomic. And that question I would say has been settled. So if you look now, um, humeral head, hemiarthroplasty, and that can be a resurfacing or that can be with a stem, but the bottom line is humeral head hemiarthroplasty. It, it has a low loosening rate of the humerus, that is true, and you don't have glenoid uh, loosening because you don't have a glenoid implant, but you have massive glenoid problems. The metal humeral head will wear away on their um, remaining glenoid and cause continued glenoid erosion, glenoid-based pain. Yes, so sir. if you look at the uh, Columbia study from Bill Levine, um, when they looked at, I think it was only seven years out. I mean, like relatively, you know, medium term follow up. Right. Only a third of the patients were satisfied with their shoulder. I mean, really because they had eroded. If you look at the Mayo Clinic um, published data, and you look even in young patients under age 55, 
if you look at the total shoulder versus hemiarthroplasty for even those younger patients, the revision rate is higher with the hemi. And why are they getting revised? Glenoid-based pain. So there is a revision rate of the total, it's glenoid loosening, but the glenoid-based pain is more common and actually leads to more revisions than loose glenoids. So again, higher revision rate, more pain, lower patient satisfaction, and studies show actually less range of motion, which is a little odd, but um, the bottom line is the amount of hemiarthroplasty done in the US has gone down, down, down. The hemi resurfacing, which is really cool, the little cap procedure, you pop it on there, that's gone way, way down as well, um, because that in some of the like long-term data, some of the registries out of Europe has the highest revision rate. So bottom line is, the HEMI is kind of a dying, a dying art. It still has a, um, it still has a role though, for, especially for AVN, where there's no cartilage problem at all in the glenoid. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, there's something called the ream and run procedure, popularized in Seattle by Rick Matson, where you prep the glenoid by reaming it. And the idea is you get, get like a fibrous growth on there. So that's a good kind of biologic way of dealing with the glenoid. So HEMI with that biology. And then the other thing is alternate bearing surfaces. So there's some early data out of Europe and Australia on pyrolytic carbon. So it's the smoothest bearing surface in shoulders, pyrolytic carbon hemiarthroplasty. And basically it's more, uh, it's closer to the modulus of elasticity of bone and lower friction. And so it doesn't have, the theory is that it won't have as much of that glenoid based pain and glenoid erosion. So anyway, a lot to talk about, but that's the humoral, that's the hemi. Any questions on that, guys, before I go dive into the anatomic total and the reverse? Oh, I'm loving it so far. Just to kind of review a little bit of what you were just talking about. Um, first, you talked about the osteocapsular. Um, uh, you talked about the osteocapsular when you go arthroscopically. Yep. And that was more for younger patients where their main complaint was stiffness. They had a lot of central wear. Um, and then Not central also, or centered arthritis. Centered so no arthritis. subluxation on the lateral. Yep. Mm -hmm. Centered arthritis. Sorry. Um, and then with our humeral, you know, our humeral head resurfacing or you know replacements, these tend to have higher revision rates as well as more uh, glenoid erosion and glenoid wear. Is that that correct? That's correct. So so you're not going to get glenoid erosion when you have a polyglenoid. You're going to get glenoid loosening. And the question is, you know, what's a bigger problem? What's more complicated, right, to deal with? Is it glenoid erosion or, or, or of a hemi or glenoid loosening of a polyglenoid and anatomic total? Ah, yes, sir. And it turns out for most patients, for most patients, it's going to be loosening of the polyglenoid. Now, again, you should look at Rick Matson's work. He's got a great blog, by the way, shoulder arthritis at blogspot.com. Really impressive. Um, a lot of stuff on this topic. He does that procedure on his very active patients. I've done it too. I've done it on um, uh, Special Forces Commandos, uh, Navy SEALs, FBI agents, uh, personal trainer. I mean, very, very active patients where I know the plastic glenoid isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to last because these people are, you know, they're hunting down terrorists. They're doing push-ups. They're doing really, really intense stuff. And so they, they're gonna take that higher revision rate because they wanna continue their active lifestyle because they have to for their hobbies or their, or their work. So, so again, maybe, maybe a higher revision rate, maybe not. And in those young, really, really active patients, probably the hemi, if they're really, really active, may be safer because the poly may, may not stand up to those forces. Does that make uh, sense? So yes, there's sir. a particular subset of patients where we still consider uh, the hemi, but um, the total shoulder is, is the workhorse. No, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. I think we can keep, um, I think we can keep going to our. Keep rolling? Yes, sir. I'm loving it. So the next is going to be the anatomic total shoulder replacement. So that's, um, that's basically, you're going to have a polyethylene glenoid um, and then a metal humeral head with us with a stem. There are now stemless and, um, Devices, there are kind of longer stems, shorter stems, many stems, stem, um, canal sparing, quote unquote, which is like a stemless device. The bottom line is you're replacing the metal humeral head 
Um, it's not a resurfacing though, even the stimulus, it's not a cap that goes over the humerus. You actually make a humeral head cut. Uh, and that's important because you need to be, get access to the glenoid to put the glenoid in. So it's metal and plastic bearing. The key thing is it works really well. So there's multiple prospective randomized trials that show that this works better than HEMI. Again, we talked about there may be some particular high, high, high demand patients where the HEMI may be a better choice. But for, for the vast, vast majority of your patients, this is the way to go. Better longevity of the implant, better pain relief, better range of motion. Um, so, you know, the, the way to go. The key thing is contraindications to this. So rotator cuff tear is a contraindication. A tiny, tiny, tiny cuff tear that's incidentally noted at the time of surgery uh, may be okay. But if you have anything more than a small cuff tear, that's a problem. And the reason is something called the rocking horse glenoid. So if you have a big cuff tear and the humeral head rides up, the high riding humeral head. So remember we talked about that acromiohumeral interval. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. And that narrows. You can imagine that metal ball is now going to push on that superior aspect of the glenoid component. That's going to lead to tensile forces on the inferior aspect of the glenoid component. We know in orthopedics, tension is never good. We want only compression. We don't want tension and shear. That's bad for all of our implants. It's bad for bone. We want compression. So when that happens, you get loosening of the glenoid uh, at an early rate. So we don't do total shoulders when you have a massive um, cuff tear. Another kind of complication of these anatomic arthroplasty procedures would be a cuff tear postoperatively or what's called subscapularis insufficiency. This is when you do the shoulder replacement, you go through a deltopectoral approach, so between the deltoid and the pec and the internervous plane, and you have to take down the subscap. You can cut the tendon, you can do what's called a lesser tuberosity osteotomy. The bottom line is you have to get in the shoulder somehow. And then you repair that on your way out. And if that doesn't heal or you didn't do good subscap releases or the patient falls or what, or they stretch too far, too fast with therapy or whatever, um, then it's equivalent to having a massive cuff tear. So they will get early glenoid loosening and they will have poor motion. That's subscapularis insufficiency. So you want to avoid that complication all costs. So anyway, total sh shoulder does well as long as you got a good cuff and you have meticulous handling of your cough at the time of surgery. And I've seen a bunch of questions about the, uh, it always comes up about the subscap and in, in total shoulder uh, arthroplasty. And just like you were just talking about the subscap insufficiency and that being a cause of um, uh, a failure of arthroplasty. But yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's great that you're saying that. And I just wanted to reiterate that for those listening that, you know, he's dropping gems and, and, and nuggets every, every two seconds here. So this is all, you know, some really good stuff. So if that's been on the OIT a lot, that subscap insufficient, we can spend a couple sentences on that. The bottom line is um, on your axillary lateral, you may see anterior translation of your humeral head. So think about the rotator cuff keeps the humeral head centered. And if your subscap is torn, then the head will ride a little bit forward. So um, most of the things arthritically make it ride posteriorly, right? But some scap out makes it ride forward. Right. They may have increased passive um, external rotation because there's no kind of anterior capsule or subscap in the front. They may have anterior instability, so where the humeral head's actually dislocating at the front because there's no restraining structures in the front anymore. And they're going to have an abnormal belly press test. So they're going to have those subscap tests that we know about from our rotator cuff learning are going to be up. Normal. So if you have if you have a picture of a patient with an abnormal belly press test and a arthroplasty in place, you're already thinking this is probably subscaps out. I mean, you'll read the question, but that's just with those two pictures, you're already uh, or that that question stem and that picture of the belly press test abnormal. Think subscap insufficiency, and the treatment for that. If it's really really early, like you catch it in the first week or two, some people will try to repair the subscap. If it's, um, and they probably won't give you that because that one's controversial. If it's six, eight, 10 weeks out, that's more, they'll probably give you once a couple months out. That's not controversial at all. You have to revise to a reverse total shoulder because the rotator cuff, uh, it, it, unless it's very, very early, is not going to be repairable in that scenario. And yeah, that was actually going to be my next question. What are some of the kind of the next step for some of these procedures though. So if this fails, if the total shoulder fails, what, what do you consider doing next? Or if the hemi 
arthroplasty fails, what do you consider next? So some of the, I guess, salvage uh, procedures that will come along with some of these treatments. So I'll give you the kind of, um, I'll give you the sort of, uh, well, we should talk about reverse total shoulder, but I'll, I'll answer that and then we'll get to that. So the bottom line is, the quick answer is, pretty much any revision shoulder arthroplasty is going to be a reverse, period. Okay. So revision of hemi, total, reverse, you know, whatever it is, you're basically going to revise to reverse. And the reason is the reverse can deal with so many problems. Glenoid bone loss, no problem. Rotator cuff tear, no problem. Instability, no problem. You know, humeral bone loss, not a big problem. You know, it really, the things that you might encounter in a reverse setting or in a revision setting are going to be very easily managed with a reverse. Now, and there are actually some, some retrospective kind of case cohorts where they look at revisions of to, revision of, say, hemi to total versus reverse. There's some data on that. It's not great data, but there's data. The reverse tends to do a little better. Now, there are still scenarios where we might consider, for example, if you have a hemi and the patient is young, but then they start to get that glenoid erosion, but they still have a great cuff, and they have some glenoid erosion to where it's painful, but not so much that you don't think you could put a glenoid in and they're still relatively young and still relatively ac uh, active, definitely revise that to an anatomic total. Um, you know, if the humeral head and humeral stem are still in a good spot, you can keep the stem and pop the head off and put in a plastic glenoid, pop the head back on and repair the cuff, or repair the subscap. So, you know, there are still times we do that, but the majority of your revision orthoplasty is gonna be to reverse with the possible exception of like a hemi where everything looks perfect uh, where you might go to an anatomic total. Um, but if you have like a loose glenoid, you're not going to put another, typically not going to put another plastic glenoid back in. You're going to revise to reverse if you have a loose polyglenoid because you need the glenoid to be perfect. If you have a cuff tear and it's more than just a really, 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 really fresh one, you're not going to try to repair that. You're going to end up revising. So anyway, it's usually reverse. Good to know. And so let's Tell us some of the pearls of the reverse total shoulder. Oh, yeah. So the reverse total so. shoulder um, is very, very helpful uh, for a lot of things. It was originally sort of designed for use with rotator cuff arthropathy. So a totally different type of arthritis than what we've been talking about here. But it really works well when there's glenoid bone loss. So you can use an anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty with a posterior augmented glenoid component. There are three or four of those in the market now. Um, uh, one that I should say I designed as we have disclosure, the, the Tournier uh, Perform Plus, but there are other ones in the market. Nice. And that works That works well. Well, it's just to make sure we're all, uh, you know, being uh, upfront about <laughs> right. our, right. our, our uh, conflicts of interest. <laughs> but the, um, but that, that, you know, it works really well when there's good cough and there's some posterior erosion. The other thing that works really well is reverse total shoulder. It works really well for glenoid bone loss. And the reason is the reverse base plate is not as sensitive to version or a little bit of bone loss as that polyethylene glenoid is. So you can deal with a little burnt bone loss much more easily with the reverse. Hmm. And so for your patients that are older, um, reverse is a way to go, even if they have an intact cough, um, if they have a fair amount of bone loss. So if you see a lot of bone loss, Basically, if I see bone loss, a significant bone loss, an elderly patient, and or bad rotator cuff, I'm thinking reverse. If I, I, I need to have the, the bone loss needs to be either non-existent or able to be addressed with a posterior augmented glenoid, and the rotator cuff has to be good to do the anatomic total. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Makes perfect sense. One quick word of thoughts about the rotator cuff and total shoulder and primary arthritis. So you might think, well, how do you know the rotator cuff? Do I have to get an MRI on all these patients? Well, I mentioned earlier about the CT scan, number one. Number two is the percent of patients with anatomic, um, sorry, the position of, percent of patients with primary glenohumeral arthritis that have rotator cuff tears is significantly lower than age match controls. So that's super strange. So what I mean by that is if you take patients over the age of 60 that have no shoulder pain at all, no shoulder arthritis, 
the amount of rotator cuff tears, about 25%. So these are people with no arthritis and no pain. Right. Yes, you take that same category that have arthritis and pain, it's like 5%. It's hmm. much lower. And there's some thoughts about kind of um, there's something if you want to, it's beyond the scope of this, but if you want to read about something called the critical shoulder angle, it's a great grand rounds topic, by the way, huh. um, super well circumscribed and a lot of people wouldn't have heard of it, but um, if they're not shoulder folks, but the critical shoulder angle has to do with kind of the way the chromium and glenoid are in orientation. And it's thought that if it's a really, really large angle, it will lead to rotator cuff tears and if it's really a small angle it'll lead to arthritis and so one you know one might be productive against the other and that's another reason why you don't have to worry a lot about rotator cuff uh, tears in these patients with your primary arthritis yeah i'm definitely gonna have to look up the uh the, this critical shoulder angle uh definitely before i do the sports rotation as well um sounds like something something we should we should know uh, what, in what cases are, cause you know, you always read about, you know, arthrodesis of the shoulder. Um, is that, is that even, is that still being done? And if it is being done, in what cases would we, would we be doing that? So, um, it, we used to say arthrodesis was for like very young, very active patients. That indication is no more. I mean, we have better options now for those patients and we have better salvage options for when those first options fail. So we don't do it for the young, active laborer type patient. We would do something else. We do it for patients where they have arthritis and they have significant uh, nerve problems. So the, ro the reverse needs a functioning deltoid to work. You can have massive cuff tear, you can have all kinds of other problems, but you need a functioning deltoid. So, yes, sir. If, so the arthrodesis is done if they have no deltoid or no axillary nerve and they have arthritis. That's who might consider, or that's the, kind of the main indication for arthrodesis because there's not really a good reconstructive option for those patients. Another reason to do arthrodesis would be, I mean, we do arthrodesis for instability, that's failed everything. So like your Ehlers-Danlos patient that's failed every operation and they have kind of no other way to keep their shoulder stable. Again, that is a last resort. Um, we'll do it for um, a few other, but that's really what it is. It's really gonna be arthritis with massive um, cuff tear and then the deltoid and, axillary, deltoid and or axillary nerve aren't working. Dr. Gary, is there anything, is there anything about shoulder arthritis that you think the people listening should definitely know or take home. I know we went over a lot and, you know, we, you did an excellent job talking about, um, you know, everything from history, physical exams, imaging, all the different options uh, as far as treatment, you know, non-operative as well as operative treatment. Is there anything or any pearl that you think that people listening to this should take home with them or, or get out of this talk? I mean, I think, I think we covered it. I think, uh, you know, the, the science of it, I think the key is the stuff we didn't cover, which is kind of the soft skills of just make sure you listen to your patients, you know, work hard, listen to your mentors. Um, and, uh, and you know, there's a, there's a lot to be learned in shoulder arthritis. I love being a shoulder and elbow surgeon and, and there's, it's kind of a very dynamic field. So I think we've covered all the details um, also, I have a website. It's uh, www.drgshoulder.com, drgshoulder.com, drgshoulder.com. It has a lot of stuff in there, mostly centered for, or mostly um, for patients. I guess if you want to know another good website, I would go to, there's a great, my friend Len Funk in England has a website, uh, and it is shoulderdoc dot co dot uk it has a ton of great useful information on there on that website you can find the original book codman's the shoulder you can also buy a reprint of that from the american shoulder and elbow surgeons i would try to get a copy of that it's free online on the shoulder doc website huh. and, and just read i mean read the anatomy chapter alone is amazing it is the it is the best written most entertaining shoulder textbook and the guy was so far ahead of his time 
Really? Yes. Read the yeah. anatomy chapter on that. I mean, such facts as humans have the largest acromion for their size with compared to any animal in the animal kingdom apart from the armadillo. I mean, how else oh. would you learn that except by reading his book? It's incredible. <laughs> wow. That's wild. So, <laughs> so totally recommend that. And again, it's free online on that shoulderdoc.co.uk. And then check out my website too. We've got some stuff and posting thing, more things every day on there. Well, you know, we really appreciate you coming on. Um, thanks again so much for coming on and, and being a guest and talking about shoulder arthritis.